So what about management? Well, dressings, um, it really should be a dry, sterile dressing. So dry, sterile sheets and or dry, sterile blankets would be the most appropriate way to manage any of these burns. Now, can you put any type of cooling or moisture to it? The answer is yes, but it, it has got to be a very small burn. If you are getting ready to take national registry, don't do that. It, it should be dry, sterile dressings is what you're looking for on any type of examination that you're getting ready to take. My point is that if I have a 1% body surface area burn on my left arm, um, I'm probably going to put a little bit of cooling or moisture to it to try to take some of the sting out of it. But we should not be doing that on an examination. It's always going to be a dry, sterile dressing um, and then transport to the appropriate facility. So make sure that we are following uh, all of the other trauma guidelines as they relate to the airway, breathing, and circulation. We have them on high flow oxygen if needed. Um, and especially if they have any type of upper airway burn or you think that there's carbon monoxide or cyanide that goes along with that. And then we want to maintain body temperature. And that is the whole reason why we do the dry, sterile dressings. Uh, moisture will cause them to drop their body temperature, and it puts them at risk for hypothermia. And we know the hypothermic patient, they don't have the ability to heal, um, and they don't have the same compensatory mechanism. So we don't want to drop body temperatures. That is why I'm saying if I have a very small burn to my arm, you're not going to make me hypothermic from a 1% burn to my arm. It would be appropriate to put some cooling or moisture to it. Uh, but certainly if it is any type of significant burn, we don't want to do that because we don't want to lower their body temperature. Patients with moderate or major burns need 100% oxygen and continuous pulse oximetry. If there are any of those other combustibles that have been included in that, like CO or cyanide, remember that your pulse ox may not be uh, a very good indicator of how you are doing with your patient. And then early intubation is paramount. If you don't have the ability to intubate as far as like sedation and paralyzation, of these patients, take them to a local facility unless you're just really close to a level one or a burn center. Um, in Northern Kentucky here, greater Cincinnati area, we're probably close enough that we can just get them to University Hospital, which is where they need to be. If you're uh, logged in from one of the other outlying areas, then be familiar with your uh, geographic region and where you should be transporting those patients to, uh, but you're just wasting time taking them to a local facility. Uh, yeah, they may be able to get the airway for you, um, and then you can continue on transporting or call for air medical evacuation, et cetera. But if you can just get them to where they need to be and their airway is protected, we know through evidence-based um, medicine that that is the best thing for the patient. Uh, as far as tetanus status, because the skin has been broken and we know that that is a barrier protective mechanism, um, then, then we want to make sure that the patient does, in fact, get tetanus. Um, and this is a, a pretty high priority in the emergency department. So we all take tetanus and tetanus administration for granted and probably get it, you know, at your, uh, your annual physical if it is needed at that time. Uh, but in these situations, it is very important and they will make sure that they do in fact get a tetanus shot. All right, management as far as fluids are concerned. So fluid resuscitation, all burns greater than 20% of the body surface area. We should make sure that we have at least two large bore IVs above the waist. Um, in large bore IVs in this situation, I'm thinking a 16 at minimum. Um, and, and maybe even bigger than that, a 14 gauge, and that's probably what most of us carry. They do have 12 gauge angiocath, but most of us don't carry those. It's 14 or 16 gauge. Um, and then lactated ringers, if you have that available. If you do not, normal saline would, would be an appropriate uh, selection here. The reason for lactated ringers is that if you take the LR and kind of break it down, it more closely mimics uh, the constituent parts of blood and blood plasma. So the lactated ringers in burn patients is probably a better selection of fluid. The, the reality is most of us just don't carry it, so we go back to the normal saline. But certainly in a burn center or once you get the patient to the hospital, they're probably going to stop your normal saline and transfer uh, the fluid over to a lactated ringers. We need to think about the fluid resuscitation formulas, and we're going to talk about those, uh, but don't delay transport. Remember, their airway is a huge priority. 
So don't delay transport to try to gain an IV access. And then if you have the ability uh, to monitor intake and output, then we should think about doing that so we know if they are being fluid resuscitated appropriately. And then when we look at the fluid resuscitation, we'll talk about what those numbers are. All right, so here's the fluid resuscitation that I was just mentioning, the Parkland formula. And the way that we do the Parkland formula is four cc's of fluid times the per or times their body weight in kilos times the percentage of body surface area burned. So four cc's times the body surface area burned times their weight in kilos. And whatever that number is, we need to multiply that out and come up with a number. And it is going to be a pretty good sized number. So what we do then is we take half of that number and we administer the fluids in the first eight hours. And that is actually from the time that the injury occurred. The second part of this is whatever that number remaining is, we need to administer that fluid in the remaining 16 hours. So if we did, just for instance, we have our four cc's um, that we're administering times their weight in kilos, and we'll say it's 100 a kilo patient, and let's say that they have a 25% body surface area burn, that ends up becoming 10,000. So this patient needs 10,000 cc's or 10 one liter bags of fluid in the next 24 hours. So I would divide that in two, which obviously is going to be 5,000, and that is how much needs to be infused to this patient in the first eight hours after sustaining the burn. The remaining 5,000 would come into play on the remaining 16 hours after the first eight hours has been infused. This was developed um, by a guy named Baxter um, at the Parkland Hospital in, at Southwest University. Interestingly enough, the same place that John F. Kennedy was transported to um, after he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. So the Park, Parkland Hospital is right off the interstate in Dallas, Texas. It's easily visible from the interstate if you've ever been in that area. Uh, but the Parkland formula was, was created by Baxter at that hospital back in 1960. So there is another formula here that, that you may or may not have heard about, and that is the Brook formula. Um, and it is two cc's, not three, two cc's times the weight in kilos times the percentage of body surface area burn. So same exact concept here. Um, and then there's even a third one called the modifier, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, consensus formula, and that uses two to four. So really the one from a testing and from protocol that we should be following is a Parkland formula, four cc's times our weight in kilos, times the percentage of area burned, and whatever that number is divided in two, give half in the first eight hours, and then the other half in the last 16. So how do we know if we're doing this effectively? Well, we need to make sure that we are maintaining a urinary output in an adult at about 30 to 50 cc's per hour, and that breaks down to 0.5 to 1 cc per kilo per hour, and that is a total normal urine output. So as a normal adult, you are normally urinating about 30 to 50 cc's per hour anyway, and that is where our, our guide it should be for a patient that has been burned. We need to make sure that we are, um, are administering enough fluid to where their output is at 30 to 50, and if it is not, then they need to increase their fluids. And then you can see children two to 12 years of age is 30 cc's per hour, and then children less than two years of age, it's one cc per kilo per hour. And what we should also be looking for is making sure that the patient is on a monitor. Um, and if they are tachycardic, then we probably need to increase their fluids as well. Pain management, we've talked about first and second degree burns. First degree burns, you're gonna survive and you, know, you can kind of get over it within a couple of days, even without any type of pain management. Second degree burns, you're probably gonna need something um, or the patient is going to need something to maybe overcome that. And then certainly if they have third degree burns, uh, that is going to be an uncomfortable thing because of the second that is associated with that. So some of the medications that you may think about as Motrin, 1200 of Motrin would be appropriate. We could think about um, ketamine, um, fentanyl, 
So morphine, again, follow your regional protocol and give the, uh, the pain medication based on what uh, your particular protocol is telling you to do. These should not be given IM and we should not be giving anything IM uh, through a burned area with the exception of tetanus. If they need a tetanus and diphtheria um, administration, uh, then we can certainly do that through the intramuscular route. But other than that, don't do anything through IM. I told you about patients that have circumferential burns to their chest and or extremities, um, and they may need to have surgical incisions that are done. And this is what I'm talking about. This is an escherotomy. So if you can appreciate, I have a burn, I have all kinds of fluid that leaks into the, the soft tissue space. Now my leg is becoming very swollen and it becomes very tight. And when that happens, if I don't relieve that pressure, uh, the vasculature is not going to be able to pump blood in and out the way that it is supposed to. So I'm going to end up with muscle breakdown, uh, myonecrosis, um, and all kinds of bad things that are now circulating around in the body, i.e., potassium amongst other things. So what they will do is they will do these escherotomies um, either on the chest or on the, um, the extremity to relieve that pressure. So this is when they have either a compromised air exchange talking about the chest wall or vascular status if we're talking about one of the extremities. It is a surgical incision. Um, your air medical providers are permitted to do this. So if you happen to be in one of the outlying areas um, and you think that they need an escherotomy, definitely call for air medical, and then they can make the determination on whether or not it is an appropriate procedure for that patient.